We are activating your unique self-discovery one show at a time. The Orchard of Wisdom Self-Discovery Podcast at your fingertips. Just waiting to inspire and invite you in discovering just how awesome you really are. And how to navigate through life in joy, enrichment, personal abundance, in mind, body, spirit, heart and soul. All the people we bring you are here to serve you on your journey of life. Do enjoy our next show. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of our Global Veterans right here on selfdiscoverymedia.com. I'm your host, Sarah Troy, and what we have here today is Navy Rear Admiral Kyle Kozat. He's written a wonderful book and it's called Relentless Positivity, A Common Veteran Battling Uncommon Odds. And I can imagine that there must be a lot of uncommon odds there. He's uh, the unparalleled courage in service and life. Throughout his storied military career as a Naval Rear Admiral, he showed grace, courage, resilience in his service to the American people. Not only did he lead at various levels uh, within Navy aviation, joint multiple service during his career and five critical assignments. He's also served in a variety of diverse leadership positions within the Navy and Department of Defense, including the 22nd Senior Director in the White House Situation Room, Commander Joint Task Force at Guatemala Bay, and Commander of the Naval Educational Training. To say that he's qualified would be an understatement. But in his upcoming book, Relentless Positivity, A Common Veteran Battling Uncommon Odds, it allows the readers into the life of this remarkable human, despite living with the challenges of being a paraplegic, the result of a tragic accident, and later uh, continues to live a life as he always has, facing all the potential roadblocks head on and blowing past them with sheer abandonment and through faith and determination he has in embedded in his life challenges with the relentless positivity that is highlighted in his little new book the relentless positivity positivity is something that if we don't have in our life we can't navigate forward we have to look at life no matter what it deals to us because very often it deals a rough hand and we think it's happening to us but when we pause long enough we realize it's happening for us where's our strength where's our courage where's our abilities because we're never given anything that we can't truly cope with so how did kyle cope with all of this welcome to the show love Sarah, thanks so much. Um, you know, it's a great question. And number one, uh, that was the kindest introduction I've ever received. Uh, so I'm definitely going to download uh, this uh, this podcast. But um, you. you've heard people say this before where, you know, a single moment in your life uh, can change your life forever. Uh, and that's exactly what happened to me on uh, May, uh, sorry, March 16th of 2018. Um, up to that point, uh, as you said, I'd have a, a successful Navy career. I had served for almost 32 years. Uh, I had the risen to the ranks of two-star Navy Admiral in charge of uh, a large organization of 50,000 people. Uh, and, you know, I was, you know, literally on top of my game, but uh, uh, suffered a freak accident uh, shortly after coming to Pensacola and the Naval Education and Training Command. Um, it, uh, I wish I had something, you know, sexier. <laughs> falling down some stairs, uh, which would have, you know, been climbing Mount Everest or uh, sky jiving or paratrooping or, you know, doing something a little more uh, dramatic. But uh, it literally was a freak accident uh, in our historic home. Um, and, you know, that one night, uh, I don't have a, a tremendous amount of recollection other than a feeling of helplessness where, you know, I couldn't move my legs. I couldn't feel uh, from my waist below. Mm. I, you know, we all get these redirects in life. And, you know, I, I slid off a rock and broke three bones in my ankle, you know, and it's always the stupid things that kind of do the most damage. And no, you know, everybody thinks that, especially in your line of business, that it must've been in the line of duty, et cetera. But, you know, it's uh, life happens again to us for particular reasons. And I can imagine at the time you wouldn't have been able to make sense of why, 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 why? Uh, but then when we can get out of the why and go, okay, what am I meant to do with this? Boy, Where am I meant to go? <laughs> uh, you know, and, and that's a great setup because, um, you know, I, I remember, you know, several things uh, about, uh, and 
again for your your uh, listeners. Yes, the sound so of blue good. angels in the background. So um, I can't apologize for them because that's the sound of, of freedom here in Pensacola, Florida. But um, I can remember distinctly waking up in the ICU uh, and during those first couple of days, you know, as I came off pain medication, you know, my neurosurgeon coming in with my wife to deliver the news and his prognosis that uh, you know because of the significant uh, trauma to my spinal cord, I would not only never walk again, but I'd never be able to get up out of a wheelchair. Mm. And, uh, um, you know, it, it was really was a decision time for me. And, you know, I, I'm a very faithful guy. And I kind of walked through the things that motivated me to, you know, do what I've been able to do up to this point, uh, following the injury. But, um, you know, I, I knew that I had a decision to make. Uh, and I could either lay in bed and feel sorry for myself and ask the why question. But, you know, I, I refused to do that. Instead, I looked to see hey, w- w- what can come out of this, because, um, you know, I, I think you probably if you if you go Google four truths or five truths, you know, you'll see a myriad of different discussions. But, you know, one of the things that I latched on to very early in the process um, was that, number one, God has a plan for each one of us. Mm-hmm. Um, number two, we're all here for a reason. Uh, and despite your circumstance, you know, we can always make a difference in the lives of others. And so that's what I latched on to uh, is to not so much why, but what's next. Yeah. Um, I, I interview a great deal of many veterans. So, you know, I'm not a pro-war person at all. And people say, why do you interview so many veterans? And I said, because I have such admiration for the adversity that they have to face in life. And that you know, how many of them, because of that adversity, because of those challenges the, from their service, where it's led them to where they are today, it's what they do with it. It's like how they were on the battlefield you're, you're facing a situation. Uh, you don't have time to kind of moan or whine about it. You've got to deal with it right there and then. And how many of them come back and realize this is missing? This is not serving me. I'm not getting what I need. And so they created a platform to serve people who are missing that particular need. And I always feel that the mindset you know, of a warrior is to look at okay, how can this serve? How can this benefit others? And I think when you can change from the victimization to Mm -hmm. the, um, okay, this is a new platform. What am I meant to do with this platform? Where am I meant to go with it? How can I still inspire people to move forward? Because everybody goes through something in life, the cosmic two by four that stops us dead in our tracks. Mm -hmm. But what we do with it is really the test of who we are. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And so, you know, I never really set out to inspire people. I never really set out to write a book, to tell you the truth. Um, but, but I will tell you that, you know, I fell back. So, you know, I, I was a career uh, Navy pilot for, you know, the first 32 of 35 years. Uh, and one thing that, you know, I learned uh, among many things during those 32 years is, you know, your flight plan always changes. And I consider this a change in my flight plan. But, um, you know, I also learned in those 32 years, you know, how to be resilient, how to be tough, um, how to be adaptive, how to change uh, and, you know, explore and make the best out of whatever your circumstance. And so, you know, I had several things as, uh, as I went from the ICU uh, on into inpatient physical therapy uh, that, uh, that really led as my inspiration and the, the kind of my North Star. You know, obviously the first one was my faith uh, and uh, I couldn't have done anything, you know, without, you know, my faith in God. Um, But I had an incredibly strong family um, to include uh, a young son who is uh, also a Navy pilot. And when uh, I moved from the ICU into uh, my inpatient physical therapy, my son was getting ready to go on his first deployment. So um, he was going to fly his helicopter on board a ship uh, and he was going to be gone um, with uh, limited communications uh, with the family for the next seven months. And, you know, I, I can remember my wife telling me that, you know, he said, Hey mom, you know, I'm going to ask to stay behind for a little while and help out here. Uh, and my wife, Amy, who is uh, um, probably stronger than I am, <laughs> told them a few simple things, you know, great, gave him great advice. She said, number one, you go do the job that you had trained to do. Um, you go do it safely. Uh, and I'll worry about your dad. I'll take care of your dad. And she told him, mind you, uh, you know, 36 hours prior to this, the doctor had told us, you're never going to get out of a wheelchair. Well, she promised my son that I would walk across the ramp, walk across the flight line when he got home uh, and give him a hug. And, you know, as soon as I heard that, I cringed inside. Yes. Um, but there is no stronger motivation than mm-hmm. 
having something like that to look forward to to work for. You know, you, you mentioned a few times inpatient therapy, but what people have got to be careful of is the inpatient therapy. You know, you can't rush things. The things are going to happen as your determination, your tenacity, your resilience, all of that counts, but your body will heal as it needs to heal and how it heals is a great deal to do with your mind and heart connection. Couldn't agree more. And I can remember, you know, specifically, and, and this may strike you as a, a weird motivation, um, but uh, the very first day uh, that I started my physical uh, therapy sessions, um, went in and, uh, you know, number one, I'd been in a hospital gown for the past eight or nine days. Uh, and my occupational therapist came in, in my room in the morning. Uh, he had uh, a gym bag that my wife had packed and in it were a pair of athletic shorts, you know, an athletic t-shirt, tennis shoes. And he threw them on the bed. He said, get dressed. we got some work to do. Uh, and so that was the very first feeling of normalcy, if you will, mm. uh, that I was really, really reaching for. And I was, I was excited to embrace. Uh, and so, you know, within those first couple of days, they, uh, they hooked me up and I was in a wheelchair. Um, they hooked me up to this very clunky machine and it was able to pull me from my wheelchair up into a standing position. Uh, and the very first time that happened, it, it was euphoric because, you know, literally I couldn't roll over in bed by myself. I needed yeah. assistance to do that. Yeah. Uh, and so to be standing once again, and I'm six foot five. Um, so, you know, to be six foot five again, yes. uh, all of a sudden I had this, this flash go off in my mind that I can do this. I can do more than the doctor said. Uh, and I can vividly remember telling my wife that night, I want to go back. I want to put my uniform back on and I want to continue to serve in the Navy. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me like, you're crazy or you're still on pain meds. Why don't you go back to sleep? But that, <laughs> that was a motivation of mine because, yes. you know, you mentioned the military and, you know, for me, it, it wasn't about the battlefield. It was, it was about making a difference in other people's lives, whether yes. that was the folks who I served with or, or it was the folks, you know, who live in the same great country as I did. Uh, and it was an extremely strong motivator for me to get back and demonstrate to people what I could do uh, and how, how much I love the service. You know, and we, every single one of us on this planet are here to contribute. We're here to serve one another. And the thing is, is to find in what way are you meant to serve? Whether it's the janitor, whether it's the kitchen chef, the dishwasher or the admiral, you know, whatever our service is meant to be is always do it with pride, do it with honor and do it with conviction. And when you do find that service and it's been interrupted, all it's saying to you is, okay, you can't do it the same way anymore, but that doesn't mean you can't adapt and adopt a new way of doing it. You're right. Um, you know, I, I quickly realized. And so, you know, I spent about six weekend or six months uh, in the hospital. Uh, I'm sorry, six weeks in the hospital. And, and I went through my physical therapy to the point where I was strong enough and they deemed me independent enough uh, to be able to come home and, you know, live with the assistance of my wife, who had now kind of unassumedly, uh, you know, begotten the role of a caregiver uh, slash nurse slash mm -hmm. coach. Uh, slash everything. Yes. Um, and, and so, you know, as I made that transition, um, you know, I, I continued to work hard on, you know, my physical abilities and, you know, relearning how to do these things. Mind you, when, when I was in the hospital, you know, it, it started with, okay, getting up from a wheelchair to a walker, which the doc had said was impossible. Um, but then, you know, trying to learn how to take a step again and think back, you know, it, it's something we take for granted, but yes. just the full, motion and, you know, you got to swing your hip this way, you got to do this. Um, and that's complicated by the fact that you have absolutely no feeling below your waist. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, one step turned into 10 steps, turned into 100 steps. Uh, and, you know, is I, I am a self-admitted type A personality. Uh, <laughs> all, all naval aviators are. Um, if they tell you they aren't, they're probably telling you a fib. Uh, but, you know, we continue to count steps and I continue to, you know, move the threshold for What's my next goal? What can I do next? And, you know, part of those things were, you know, just physically getting back into our home. Um, the first, you know, probably two months that we were at home, um, I couldn't get into our house. I, I stayed uh, in a, uh, 
um, a small office area that we have on the main floor because we had 10 steps, you know, that were mm -hmm. required just to get into the house and another 24 steps that were required to get up to our main living and bedroom area. Um, and so, you know, incrementally setting those goals. Uh, and when I found out that, you know, senior Navy leaders uh, had agreed to allow me to continue to serve, you know, which in and of itself is significant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I realized then and there really something that you just mentioned is it, they didn't need me or want me for my mobility. Yes. Uh, it was all about what I had up here in my brain yeah. what I had in here in my heart uh, and what I can continue to tribute. Right. Exactly. It's just a, a readaption into, you know, focusing on what you can do and not putting the focus on what you can no longer do. Um, you know, I know it may sound weird here, but, you know, I had uh, um, epidurals when I was giving birth and there's um, one time where they actually dropped my legs after I gave birth. And, and you kind of think that when people are, you know, numb from the waist down, that they're weightless, they don't feel anything. And when they dropped my legs, which because I couldn't feel anything from the waist down, all I felt was just heavy weight. I didn't feel any pain. I couldn't feel the touch, but it just felt heavy weight that I had no control over. And it made me look at people who have, you know, got this diagnosis and we think, well, they can't feel anything. So, you know, no big deal. But you've got this heavy weight that you're carrying around that you have, you know, no maneuverability with it. You're carting this heavy weight around with you. And that really changes everything completely, doesn't it? It is. And, you know, you, you just relearn how to live life mm. uh, at that point. And, you know, from, from my physical therapy, where it was one step at a time to, you know, 10 steps to 50 steps, you know, I, I kind of made the transition um, where, you know, I got stronger and stronger. Eventually, I, you know, was strong enough where I could pull myself out of the wheelchair, hang onto a handrail and, and get myself up the 10 steps into the house. And so, you know, I, I always used to joke that, you know, for me, that was like climbing Mount Everest. Yes. Um, yes. My, no joke. <laughs> I'm going to be completely honest with you and your viewers. Uh, I got downright tired of sleeping uh, in an office outside um, when my wife started talking about her master bedroom uh, and her house. <laughs> <laughs> the the drive were there. <laughs> and, and so uh, I remember one day in physical therapy, my, my therapist said, what are we going to work on next? I said, I've got to figure out how to get up steps. Uh, and so, you know, for the next week we worked on that. Um, and, you know, I would, I would scoot up the steps on my bottom and, and you mm. know, work because, you know, those were the same steps that I fell off of right. uh, to, to cause injury. And so um, this was, uh, it was 4th of July weekend. My wife's birthday is the 24th of July. And I promised her, you know, I'd figure this out before her birthday. And um, so I'd been practicing this in physical therapy and, you know, I wheeled myself around to the steps, you know, one early evening. And she said, what are you doing? I said, I just want to, you know, transfer myself from the chair onto the steps, make sure I can do that safely. Um, and, uh, you know, there was never a doubt in my mind, I'm going all the way to the top. Um, I just didn't want to tell her that right. uh, uh, I, I, I got there. Uh, next thing you know, it was one step, it was 10 steps. And, mm. you know, uh, she came running up the stairs, you know, with a tear in her eye. Um, because, you know, for us now, life is all about problem solving and taking mm. that next step, regardless of what that step happens to be. People don't actually understand how resilient the body is if the mind is working with the body. When you're in the mindset of, oh, woe is me, why did this happen? I'm now a paraplegic, or I can't do this and I can't do that. The mind is telling the body that it can't do it. But when the mind works with the body, the body has incredible healing abilities. Um, but it, it does require the heart, mind, and the belief. You know, when you visualize yourself, I'm going to walk again. I may not be able to run or stride or this or that, but I'm going to walk again. This is what I'm telling my body. The body and the cellular structure and the sheer, uh, sheer frequency of the body, the vibration in the body that it starts to work with you and believe what you are saying to it. And this is why we always say to people, please be careful what you say about yourself, because that's A, what the universe is is reflecting back it's also what your body is hearing so if you're saying to your body we're going to walk again we're going to do this this is our challenge this is our goal your body actually is listening to you on that cellular level and it's going to work with you whether you know to what extent that is still to be decided but the fact that it's actually working with you is already showing 
the mind, heart, body, and soul connection, and that we're not separate from our body, from our mind, heart, and spirit. Well, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a testament to what you just described because, um, you know, very early in my recovery, somebody, you know, coined the term, you, you just have this relentless positivity about you. And, mm-hmm. you know, again, from my second or third day uh, in the ICU, um, I was, I was convinced I was optimistic. I said, I'm going to figure this out. It's not, I'm not going to let my circumstances dictate the rest of my life. I, I right. want to be I want to be in control. And again, you know, that's in your mind and that's in your heart. Yes. And, and you know, we've been able to do that. It's uh, um, I, I set out really writing this book as a more of a journal for my children mm-hmm. just to explain to them, you know what, well, this is what I went through. And um, this is, you know, how, what I was thinking about. This is what I was observing, you know, the whole time, just because they weren't there like my wife, Amy, was every day of physical therapy. Uh, and um that turned into a just probably a 50 page, uh, you know, little self published uh, pamphlet that I gave each one of them for Christmas. And uh, that made it out its way uh, from the family. And somebody uh, on the outside saw this and said, you've got to expand on this, you've got to write a book. And I, you know, it's, it's always humbling to say, well, I, I don't, I didn't, I haven't done anything that anyone else wouldn't have been able or willing to do. Um, but uh, I, I went ahead and, you know, started to, you know, write a chapter here and there. And um, next thing, you know, we have a book out. And so, you know, we're excited and, you know, like your mission is, is we talked about, you know, I just want to share that story that, you know, may make uh, a sliver of a difference in somebody's life, somebody who's dealing with a circumstance. And, you know, I consider circumstances anything from a significant injury that, you know, leaves you paralyzed for the rest of your life to something like a cancer diagnosis, or maybe it was a bad report card or a bad day in school, you know, uh, a, a fight with a loved one. You know, those circumstances all require us to be relentlessly positive to be able to take that forward uh, and, and, you know, make a difference in our lives. I'm going to correct you on something. Um, you said not every like everybody would do. No, not everybody does do. You know, so many people do give in. Um, I've, I've literally known people who've died from the diagnosis and not the disease. Uh, and the people that get handed this and it's why me and become, you know, so embraced in the victimization of it, they're unable. It does take a certain mindset. It does take a certain resilience, a certain tenacity to say, I'm not going to give in. Now there's the initial grief, the initial transition, the initial, my God, what has happened? And then the, okay, now what do I do with it? Not everybody gets there. And I think, you know, A, your faith, B, your training, and C, your heart. We're very much in, you know, in, no, we're not going to give up or give in here. We're going to try our damned best. But not everybody has that ability. They have the choice, but not everybody makes that choice. No. And, um, you know, I saw that, you know, I'm, I'm a people watcher by, by nature. And, you know, I would show up for my physical therapy sessions 15 minutes prior. And I, w- I would just always watch other people. And I was, I was fortunate because, you know, my wife, Amy, you know, would, would go home and feed the dogs, clean the house. She'd come back for a session, then she'd go back home. And so she was with me every single time I, you know, had a, a physical therapy session. Um, and, and I watched people who didn't have that same support. Yeah. And so, she was, she was an inspiration. She was a motivation to be able to push me. Um, and, you know, I, I just really felt like I was fortunate, you know, to have that support structure there. And, you know, again, to do things And I am not, this is, again, the type A personality. I don't prescribe to the word cannot, can't. Um, mm-hmm. And when anybody tells me I can't do something, <laughs> I'm on. <laughs> turn around. You know, the are on and, you know, it's time, you know, to face the fight of your life. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've, I've learned that through naval aviation and, you know, I, I didn't have a storied career. Um, I had to work hard. I worked through some setbacks. I worked through some failures. Um, but, you know, I put those things behind me and I was able to, again, nobody's going to tell me I can't without hard work, without passion, without motivation and toughness. My father was um, a squadron leader in the war, the Spitfires. Um, before he became a pilot, because they were selective back then, he was in the Navy and sank three times. Um, and then they needed um, Air Force and uh, he actually trained in Florida. And he had he trained on all of the planes and then became the squadron leader and, you know, stealth at night uh, in Italy. And I still don't know the whole thing. I want to know, but one day I hope 
that it will be revealed. He's long gone. Unfortunately, he died very early at 45 from heart disease mm. because back then you couldn't talk about it, stiff upper lip. You couldn't uh, speak to the things that you were going in there. There was no such thing. And so it was kept in and that kept in and then just, you know, volcanically erupted and his heart gave out. And, uh, and you know, and I feel that sharing a story of, you know, adversity, of, of redirects, of challenges in life. It gives permission for people who are going through challenges to speak about this. I, you know, yours, yes, you know, you could have been a paraplegic for the rest of your life and you decided you were going to walk. Not everybody has that strength. But the inspiration of that strength gives them enough strength to say to other people, I'm struggling. I'm struggling. I need someone to talk to. I need somebody that can help navigate me through this because I want to get to that space. Right, right. It, you know, by human nature, I, I have never been a person who would ask for help or accept help. I always wanted to do things on my own, but mm -hmm. you know, th this injury really pushed me out of my comfort zone. And, you know, I, I had to rely on my nurses. I had to rely on my wife. I had to Humbled ask you. <laughs> It, it absolutely did. But you know, one of the things we had a, a president named uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was a polio victim, uh, and he spent mm -hmm. a majority of his adult life in a wheelchair. Um, but if you ever notice, uh, there are very few pictures of FDR where he's sitting in his wheelchair. Most yeah. of the time, you know, he's staged in another chair. Uh, he's behind his desk in the Oval Office. Yeah. Uh, and, and that struck me again as another motivation, you know, to say, number one, I, I, I might need help. Um, so I'm not afraid to ask for help. Uh, but, you know, if he can run a country, yeah. you know, I, gosh, I can I can work my way back to be a contributing successful member. And I was able to do that. I served my last two and a half years on active duty. Uh, I was able to return to uh, full duty. Uh, couldn't uh, pass my fitness test because uh, I'm not as fast as I used to be. Right. But I was able to return to duty. I traveled around the country. You know, I learned how to, you know, navigate unknowns of uh, commercial airplanes and how to get myself on and off, uh, work our way through airports. Uh, and it's now just, you know, second nature. Uh, yeah. Following my, uh, uh, I, I love the story about your father because um, following my retirement from the Navy, I was fortunate enough to, um, you know, uh, accept the job as uh, president and CEO of the National Naval Aviation Museum Foundation here in Pensacola. Uh, and, you know, our mission is to tell stories about heroes like your father uh, and what they did uh, in our United States Navy. And so I, I feel very fortunate that uh, not only was my doctor wrong, um, I use a walker a majority of the time in the right. house, I use a wheelchair. I can drive myself with uh, hand controls. Right. And I'm, you know, fully employed and I feel like I'm making a difference today. And that's the choice that we have to make. You know, uh, again, that we don't get through life without, you know, obstacles. We don't get through life without closed doors. We don't get through life without tripping up. You know, that is, as I said, we're never given more than what we're supposed to be able to cope with, but it is the choice. Um, you know, I know many obstacles that I, I've been an asthmatic all my life. So we put a lot of stop to things and I've found a mild now and I know many people give into it and I just decided to partner with it. We're in a partnership. Right. And sometimes it says, hey, my voice is louder today and you better pay attention. OK, I respect that. I've got to pay attention because it's supporting me to do what I want to do. And if I don't pay attention to it, it will flatten me. So, you know, whenever you have a physical obstacle, you learn the boundaries of what you can and cannot do. You don't fight it. Why is, what's the point? Push to the limit that you can, but not to the point of breaking. But you learn to partner with something and go, OK, we're in this together. We're in this together. Let's support each other. Yeah. And, and I would take that even to another level where, uh, you know, a, a circumstance like that, at least for me, you know, really encouraged me to try other things. Yeah. If I couldn't do something like I could when I was able bodied um, and, and I'll be honest with you, I'm probably more uh, aggressive in the things I'll try, the things I'll do now than before I got hurt. I, I uh, um, probably seven months after my accident, uh, I attended uh, um, as part of the Navy Wounded Warrior Program, uh, an adaptive sports camp. And I, you know, went there and had no idea what to expect because, well, I haven't done that before. I haven't done this before. Um, but I was able to do things and, you know, prove to myself, hey, I can do this. Yeah. 
Um, and as a result of that, you know, I, I ended up uh, um, being selected uh, one of 40 team members that represented the United States Navy. We went to Tampa, Florida in the DOD Warrior Games. Uh, and without a doubt, I was the most senior officer there. <laughs> And I was the oldest. And so they called me the silverback. <laughs> You're not even silver. <laughs> not, not at all. Not at all. Well, it's just, it's just the light. Um, but, you know, the experience of being able to do things uh, and, you know, probably my fondest memory from that experience, two fond memories. Um, I, I had never played tennis in my life, uh, but went out and watched the, the um, wheelchair tennis competition. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, that looks like fun. Uh, maybe someday I can try that. And went out a second day after they had already selected the team. And, you know, the coach said, hey, we need one more to round out our doubles teams. Uh, and so I went out there and I, you know, swung the racket and hit some balls. And at the end, he came over and said, why didn't you try out for the team? And I said, well, you know, coach, I've never played tennis before. And he said, well, you do now. Yes. Um, and immediately I was on the tennis team and, and you just had a great time, but it, it proved to me that, um, you know, don't let anybody tell you what mm -hmm. you can't do, you know, show them what you can do, get out there and try different things. Yeah. Um, and, and you know what you can or can't, or you know that you have to adapt on how you do it. Right. You learn to listen to your own body and you know when to push and when to pull back. But how do you know what you're capable of doing unless you try? You're exactly right. One of the one of the things. Um, so this summer, we we uh, uh, always take vacations um, into the into the Rockies. Uh, so we go in the summertime, escape the heat of Pensacola, Florida. Uh, and this summertime, um, we uh, we rode bikes. Uh, we went out and we horseback rode. Uh, we rode a train. Um, I, I had a special wheelchair that I could actually hike around uh, some of the Rocky Mountain National Park lakes. And, you know, people, when, when they heard about this, you know, well, why did you try that? Weren't you scared? Weren't you, you know, concerned? And I said, you can't be concerned in life. You just have to, you know, go forward, you know, do things that you want to try, do things that you want to do. And, and again, show others that, uh, you know, there's nothing that's outside the idea of the possible. Then you push your own limits and you push through the fear. Your own common sense steps in and that gauge of, no, that, that is too dangerous. Don't do that. Right. That common sense comes up. That's foolish. Right. It knows how much you can push and how much you can't because you've learned to find that balance and listen to the common sense. This isn't fear talking. This is common sense talking. Right. And you learn that and that allows you to push or redirect or go into different directions uh, because your common sense is the driving force and not the fear. Yeah, so my common sense uh, is probably better known as Amy Kozad, my wife. Um, <laughs> I, I, Husband? Had somebody, I, I had somebody reach out to me um, several months ago uh, and, uh, you know, through through kind of the Wounded Warrior program. And um, he gave me an invitation to go out to Central Virginia uh, and do a uh, tandem jump, so skydiving. Uh, and I was like, man, I'm in, you know, tell me when I need to be there. Uh, and as soon as I told my wife about this, she said, no, that's yeah. where that's where we draw the line. So I guess she's my common sense. Yes. Well, I mean, you know, like in a lot of ways, you've become the daredevil and you probably always were. Again, you're driven by that consciousness of you no, know, pay attention to this. No. Uh, yes, you can do that. Uh, but being a daredevil, you always want to push the limits. And then having that compass of a common sense to say, hey, hey, mate, you can pull back and go, yeah, maybe you're right. You're, you're right. Yeah, that's, you know, the, the common sense is important, but, but I still, uh, you know, have adopted that personal motto that, uh, you know, I hate that word can't. Uh, and I think that should apply to all of us. Don't let anybody tell you what you can't do. Go ahead and demonstrate what you can do. And that's really driven me to the success that I've, you know, seen in the past four years in my recovery then maybe she should say, you shouldn't do that rather than you can't do that. <laughs> oh, when she says can't, I say yes, ma'am. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, this is actually something, as you pointed out before, um, the support going through therapy. You know, my son at 13 fell off a, a hook above a ravine and went down, you know, bum overhead and landed in, in the stream below with his leg behind him. He'd snapped his femur in half. Now, normally at that age and growing, the femur was splinter, but I had him on some really good nutritionals that were helping his bone growth. And he just clearly snapped in half. So much so that when they put the drill bit in to put the screws in, the drill bit came off in the bone. 
Oh my God. Right. So, you know, like that's, uh, and then I had him on those nutritionals afterwards and his bone healed extremely fast. They were really, really surprised. And it was his own common sense that said, don't do this. You feel insecure. And then, you know, the peer saying, well, if my girlfriend can do it, why can't you? <laughs> All right. And then boom, I get this phone call. <laughs> <laughs> your son's in hospital and this is two weeks before we're meant to actually go to florida on holiday so um but it, it's he recovered very quickly because he had the resilience and the tenacity he was never why me or anything else it's like i'm going to play soccer again i'm going to do this bone healed marvelously and what he actually did end up with was the the um ligament was the issue in the healing and three days before the COVID lockdown, he had snapped his Achilles heel and oh, just had an operation. I had gone over to look after him and he owns a restaurant. And then it was, OK, you know, we're locked down when well, nobody could go into the restaurant. He said, well, how do I keep people employed? So it was purely takeout. So there he is at the cashier taking phone calls with his leg in a car stuff on a chair, mm. you know, just carrying on doing what we can do. And that, you know, it's. If we don't have resilience in life, if we're not willing to adapt or adopt a new way of doing something, it doesn't matter who you are or what the obstacle is, we're going to get stuck or we're going to get paralyzed in a different way. Yeah, um, you know, I, I will go back to the can't word. Uh, and when I retired in 2020 from the Navy, uh, had a very small cer ceremony here in our museum, um, you know, because of COVID and the restrictions. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, in that speech, I said, my doctor told me that there are three things I can't do. I can't do laundry. <laughs> I can't do the dishes and I can't make the bed. Um, and to this day, uh, the biggest eye roll I have ever received from my lovely spouse uh, had been to those three things. But <laughs> I, I did another I did another uh, um, podcast recently with another group and, you know, they posted that on their social media. There are three things Kyle Kozad can't do, um, but he can <laughs> You know, but this, you can this, always uh, learn. I can learn. I can learn. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm sure learning. you'd appreciate um, it. <laughs> I'm a slow learner. Um, you know, this summer I was uh, I was given the opportunity, and and this is you know part of the magic of working for you know a, a national museum, aviation museum here in Pensacola, uh, and I was given the opportunity to go flying um, in the front seat of a Stearman aircraft. So Stearman are uh, World War II era trainers, uh, biplanes, open cockpit, uh, and uh, you know, I said, my gosh, you know, what an honor to go up with three World War II veterans uh, to be able to do something like that. And so, you know, I, I immediately agreed. And then, you know, I had that shadow of doubt. How am I going to get in physically get in the cockpit? How am I going to do these things? But, uh, you know, I was I was able to do it, um, you know, able to problem solve and figure it out. Uh, and there was no more liberating feeling than being back in the cockpit of an airplane flying with three World War II veterans, you know, than, than I had that day, uh, you know, earlier this summer at the Pensacola Air Show. I always wish I'd learned to fly because I think I got that same buzz from my from my dad. And um, I remember being out with a friend flying. He said, take the controls. And I did a 200 foot nosedive over the water and then came back up. I can't do the upside down. I have an equilibrium <laughs> problem, but um, but it, the, the exhilaration. And then when I, I lived in South Africa for 11 years and when I was leaving there and going to New York on my way here to Canada, I sat in the captain's seat for 12 hours, for six hours where he slept, uh, talking to the co-pilot and just the, the absolute wonders of just the world and the universe open to you, the silence, the beauty, the plane that's 200 miles away that you could see over there, you know, just I could see the joy, I could see the joy of the flying. And uh, I always wish that I, you know, but it was just not meant to be but um, I wish that there had been an opportunity to pursue that because um, and of course, no, it's never too late, but you know, circumstances can get in the way. I think if you, if you've had an experience, and it may be only a once, sir, what do you take from that experience into your own life? That exhilaration, that moment of connection, because it is a connection. It most certainly is a divine connection. And take that in and, and make sure you bank it. And anytime that things get tough, go and revisit it because that sheer exaltation of that moment will help rejuvenate you. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, for me, you know, I use the word intoxication. Mm -hmm. You know, there was something intoxicating about um, not not in the figurative sense, 
being able to be, I mean, that was my office for 32 years, being able right. to be airborne. Um, I love to teach other people how to fly, uh, was able to fly around the world in a couple of weeks. I mean, you know, there was nothing that I loved doing more. And so, you know, that same feeling of accomplishment, satisfaction, you know, intoxication, you know, I apply that to any obstacle I run in today. You know, you, you can still get that sense of self-satisfaction, yes. you know, with, with any circumstance in your life, whether it's, you know, getting beyond an argument with a loved one and saying, I'm sorry, or I love you uh, to, you know, overcoming a significant injury, like, uh, like the one I had. Right. Um, there, there is always something, you know, at least for me, that's been very fulfilling. Uh, and then I look for, Hey, what can I do next? You know, always continue to set that bar higher and higher. Here's a question for you. How exhilarating was the new Top Gun movie for you? It was great. We actually got to show uh, uh, an advanced version uh, of the movie uh, uh, last May here in our, our museum foundation. It was, you know, it's always a great recruitment tool for the Navy. Mm -hmm. It's fun to watch. Uh, and, you know, whether you're young and I, I watched it with a bunch of, you know, very senior naval aviators. Uh, and when they can walk out of a movie like that uh, and not say, well, this was messed up or yeah. That wasn't accurate. It's got to be a pretty good movie. And I, Tom Cruise worked really closely with the Navy to make sure that, you know, it reflected, uh, to the most part, there was a little Hollywood in it, but of it course. reflected everything about the Navy. Uh, and so it's always excited, exciting to see, you know, kind of your trade uh, up on this big giant screen. Yeah, definitely. And a good recruitment one for sure. You know, going back to, you know, how you deal with things in your spouse. Unfortunately, when my dad had his first heart attack, um, he went down the rabbit hole. He became angry. Um, he, he, one of the worst things was is the doctors gave him three months to live. Mm. Had they said, change your lifestyle, your diet, your drinking, your this, your that, I think it would have been different. But he thought, okay, he was back in the, in the cockpit. Come on, bombers, see if you can get me. And he drank more and he drove faster and he did everything else, right? He lasted another four years. But had he changed his lifestyle, I think he would have lived a great deal longer. And of mm -hmm. course, he became a miserable patient and made all of our lives absolutely hell. And I think what we've got to remember when we are facing whatever obstacle we're, we're facing, and like this is a man that, you know, came in from one of his flights with his tail on fire and still managed to land. And yeah. when at the end of the war, there was only two of them left in his squadron and they both died you know so he's been through it and he would go in and get the spies out he'd do stealth at night i mean he was brave but when it came to actually living i don't know where the braveness went and he was angry and there was a number of other things in his life that made him angry but we've got to remember yes you're going through this yes you're feeling it's unfair yes you're going you're how, how am i going to do this how am i going to navigate is my life over you're going to go through all of those emotions mm -hmm. but you've got to make sure that you don't impose that on your loved ones they're there to help you to support you and if you berate and belittle and constantly impose them with your doubt and your misery you are going to have everything around you crumble and the support will be gone yeah, that word support is so powerful and so important. Uh, and and again, you know, I lean on the support of my wife. And, you know, I, I think it's been mutually uh, uh, a mutual involvement that, you know, I support her, she supports me. Mm -hmm. but That's as a marriage should be. It, it is. And she takes that to a very different level, you know, having assumed the role as my caregiver for a very long time. You know, one of the things uh, that we tied into the book Relentless Positivity, you know, was, you know, she, when, when I was in the hospital, uh, there's a website called Caring Bridge. Uh, and Caring Bridge allows you to, you know, share your story, provide updates, um, because we were saturated with, you know, well meant calls and emails and texts. And so this was a way for us to share the progress and the next steps. And so, you know, Amy was involved in that book, uh, and she actually wrote uh, the very last chapter, the, uh, um, the, the very, you know, closing to the book that, you know, provides a real nice story. And so I, I think the book, you know, gives that balance of, you know, inspiration, but the perspective of, you know, me, and I don't consider myself the victim, you know, but her as the caregiver on, yeah. you know, she, she went through uh, the same, you know, amount of, you know, emotional distress, physical distress, you know, what are we going to do next? How are we going to do this? And I think Hopelessness, that, helplessness, how can I help him? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was the mutual support, you know, that, that hopefully comes out in the book.
the organization you're talking about caring bridges and um, when at the beginning of COVID, my cousin um, uh, darius brubeck dave brubeck's son uh, got it bad and he was in icu and they had um, they had knocked him out and for six weeks you know they were just weren't sure if he was going to come back to us or not and i was so impressed with the organization that i actually interviewed uh, someone from the organization and what it means and of course you know COVID particularly hopefully I mean it's here to stay but the you know the the dynamics of it is is still there but you know for if for loved ones or anybody that's far away and you want to have an update and it's hard for someone to keep phoning someone with an update but they can do it in one place and you can be supportive in that one place it's a very very good program so I highly recommend it yeah, agree. It was powerful for us just, you know, because there were so many people that reached out and, you know, everybody wants to know, how are you doing? How are, how are the two of you doing? Yeah. Um, what can we provide? What kind of support do you need? Um, so that was a very important mechanism. And we tried to pull that into the book to tell, you know, Amy's side of the story as well. Yeah. You know, if, if, whether it's falling down the stairs, sliding off a rock, you know, whatever it is, um, I have a, a wonderful woman here um, that I've interviewed that has it just has left a mark on me, um, Victoria Curry from Courageous Smile. And this was a woman who was beaten over 300 times while pregnant from mm. her husband. And uh, she literally has metal and wires and everything in her body mechanic to go. Her, her child was born with disabilities because of it. Um, unfortunately he was arrested but he was protected by the military and never saw a day in jail mm. whatsoever but that was another story but and she recently had to have her hand off because her hand had just completely become a claw and and she has started an organization for uh, you know, abused women or children with you know disabilities and and uh, she remarried and he started a, a wonderful you know um raising dogs for comfort um, uh -huh. animals for people and you know if anybody deserved to kind of just wallow in their grief you know with what he had done to her um and the fact that he's still out there this is what for me you know she talks about courageous smile but when i talk about a courageous heart i look at her someone like her as a hero and we just don't know how much we can cope with how much we can face how much we can come back from until we're willing to say, I'm going to give it my all. She said, I was victimized, but I was not a victim. I'm not a victim. And I think that's the way you're a victim of a fall or a victim of abuse or a victim of any crime. Yes, you're victimized, but how long you stay a victim of that circumstance is up to you. And where you find your courage to go through, that's the inspiration that begets invitation for other people. Yeah, and you know, the, the thing that inspires <clears throat> me in that short story is the fact that you know, she she looked at her circumstance and she looked beyond that circumstance. Yes. How can I help others? Um, one of the things is I got it involved in adaptive sports. You know, I got into this community of, you know, disabled veterans, disabled service members. Um, and, you know, my wife, Amy, and I will tell our story. We'll, you know, talk to people who are going through, you know, similar circumstances, similar injuries, you know, to help them cope, you know, just she talks about her perspective with, you know, a spouse, whether it's a mom, uh, whether it's a wife or a husband. Um, but, you know, I can tell, you know, from a psychological perspective, from a motivation uh, perspective that, uh, hey, this isn't the end of the world. You have a lot in front of you. Yes. Figure out what your new purpose is, you know, be tough, work your way through it uh, and, uh, you know, show some relentless positivity. A lot of people throw the word positivity around and, uh, you know, I always say positive thinking equals positive living, but a lot of people think, well, yeah, I'm being positive, but they're saying it with a negative tone. Yeah, they're saying the words, but they're not living the words. And, you know, again, going back to what you say to yourself, what you say to your body, what you say to your psyche is really, really important because if the whole of you doesn't believe that you are positive, then you're leaving a huge gap of negativity. And so, yeah, you go, all right, shoot happens. This happened to me. What am I going to do about it? How am I going to do it? Who's going to help me? Where am I going and what is transpires out of this? And yeah, you're allowed down days. You know, all of the veterans that, that uh, post-traumatic stress and one mm -hmm. of them, um, um, Henline, 
uh, he was uh, the only survivor of a hummy and he was literally burnt his scalp right down and uh, they take flesh from his body to create an eyelid and he's lost half of his arm and and he's become a comedian you know and that was his way of coping with it and he's that inspiration to other people but he says look i have bad days i have days where you know the rabbit hole opens up and i go down there and it's like I allow myself to go down there and have the pity party and then i come back out right and it's it's okay you don't have to live a facade of i'm happy and everything is all hunky dory mm -hmm. you're going to have frustrating days you're going to have bad days that is okay just don't get stuck there you're you're right you know um you know for me <laughs> the positivity you know it's it's not words but you know mm -hmm. i won't say it's not just words yeah. no it's yeah. not words it's yeah. your actions it's how you respond yeah. How you demonstrate to other people and i think you know again i can um i can joke about my circumstance mm -hmm. i can you know tell people funny things and having a sense of humor is uh you know for me has been incredibly important um i can remember uh uh when you know we were we were training for our warrior games and you know one of the things i did i i threw the shot put and i did uh, discus as well the field events and so you do it from a seated platform mm -hmm. uh, and so you wouldn't spin all around um, but I was practicing at home in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, and again, mind you, um, I was by far the most senior officer on the base. We lived in a big historic house. And so I'm out there with our two yellow labs and I'm sitting in my wheelchair and throwing the throwing the shot put and flinging the discus. And you know, then I'd get my walker and trundle across the grass and pick one up and come back. So very slow process and i said what well, i just don't have time for this and you know i had uh, um, a pair of uh, uh, comp compression shorts on and then over that i had some athletic shorts and i said i'll, I'll stick my uh, uh discus in this pocket and i'll stick another <laughs> discus in that pocket and about 12 steps into that you you know where this story is going <laughs> uh, well, my, my shorts are around my ankle thank goodness for my compression shorts. <laughs> And all I could do was laugh. My dogs yeah. are looking at me. There are two young, you know, sailors uh, that are going through their uh, technical training that are walking by. And, and I'm just thinking to myself, yep, you're some fancy two-star admiral <laughs> showing his leaks to the world. But you, you have to laugh about those things. You, you know, it helps you carry on. Humor is is huge. As I said, Bobby Henline, you know, it, he literally was burned to the scalp, um, total disfigured, but humor is what brought him back. You know, another young woman, Keshi, who's uh, singing, brought her back. She was in a plane crash and uh, burned 65% of her body. And she went on America's Got Talent and made it up to the end and came back for the champions and made it up to the end. And initially when people looked at her and they could see the disfigurement, that's what they saw. Then when she sang, people felt her heart mm -hmm. and they felt who she was to have the courage to stand there and be herself despite what had happened to her that inspiration is such an invitation to other people right and but humor you know don't take what's happened to you so seriously it's serious enough to protect yourself serious enough to work through it but not so serious that you become what happened to you learn to laugh about it learn to laugh about the goofy of the silly things that happen along the way, because if you don't, you do get caught up in serious and that can bog you down. It, it sure can. You know, I, I go back to uh, the story I told you. Um, you can never take yourself too seriously. Uh, you can never misuse your sense of humor. Um, but, you know, I go back to the promise that my wife made my son uh, when I was, you know, two days post surgery that I was going to walk across. Um, in November, and, and mind you, I was hurt in March, uh, he flew his helicopter back in, and we were in Jacksonville, Florida, so this was November of uh, 2018, um, and I was able to walk, it was probably 50 yards on my walker, uh, and to this day, whenever my wife sees a picture of me giving my son a hug for the first time, uh, she uncontrollably cries. Yes. But you know that was the motivation, and, and it was you know that motivation lies within each one of us. You just have to find yeah. it. What what is your special purpose? Your special meaning to be able to do that? And you know just that moment um, allowed me to push myself through so many other barriers and obstacles. And you know today I'm a president and a CEO of a nonprofit. Uh, I love what I'm doing and. You know opportunities like this thank you sarah you know to be able to tell that story and you know hopefully encourage or inspire uh somebody else who has a circumstance in their life that seems to be you know large and big and insurmountable 
I love people who have the redirects. I have somebody else on this week, actually, who was a New York cop that actually helped start the special victims course and uh, the um, anti-corruption and also work with the FBI um, on counterterrorism. And his experience was just so illuminating of what he'd seen, what he'd done, that sheer tenacity to go after something. Well, this is needed. Let's just make it happen. This is needed. This is missing. Let's make it happen. And, you know, those are the driving leaders of change, right? But in, in everything, there's always a price to pay whether it is your legs or whether it's emotion or whatever it is, there's always a price to pay. And I think it's, it's to always remind yourself what, what weighs more, the triumphs, you know, mm. or the price, and that you can't have the triumphs without. And, uh, you know, where do you put your focus in? On the triumphs, on the things you did achieve. Um, you know, a lot of people in the caregiving business get burnt out because the one they couldn't save or the one they couldn't help. Right. And you've got to concentrate on the ones that you did. And also to realize it's a two-way street. It's you and them working together. And if the other person um, can't give their all, then you can't help them full way. And there's some that give their all and never get there. Uh, but if they're knowing that you've tried, that's the important thing, right? I gave it my all. And this was the limit that I could go to. But I gave it my all and I'll accept that and do whatever I can do instead of looking at what I can't. Yeah, I, I love that attitude. You know, every morning that I wake up, um, you know, I, I kind of go through a Bible verse in my mind and it's from Psalm 118. This is the day the Lord hath made rejoice in it. And, and that gives me a sense of, uh, you know, since my accident uh, and, you know, before that, maybe I was that guy who, you know, pushed and, you know, tried everything and did everything, um, certainly not with reckless abandon. But, you know, I realized that, you know, we can't take a single moment in our lives for granted. Um, always say, I'm sorry. Always say, I love you. Uh, make that phone call, do whatever it is, but get out there and try things. Don't say, I'll do that next week. Right. I can remember when uh, um, my father, we, we had, uh, uh, we were big fishermen. We loved to go fishing. Uh, and he always wanted to go to Alaska uh, and fish. And so um, I've got two brothers and my son, and, you know, we had a trip to Alaska all set up and, you know, one brother, you know, got busy with his work. Another brother had, you know, I've got baseball for my son, so I can't make it. And we, we decided, Hey, we'll do this next summer. Right. Uh, and, and with the next summer, you know, my father uh, contracted stage four cancer and, mm -hmm. you know, he was gone in January that following year. And, and so, you know, when I think about what we lost with that yes. opportunity uh, and I think about, you know, the things that, you know, I may have wanted to try or may have wanted to do before, you know, my injury, um, you've got to seize every moment of every day of every week of every month of every year uh, and live life to its fullest. The big word gratitude. You know, the youngest person I ever interviewed was 10, and she'd written a book about 365 days of the year of gratitude with a positive attitude. And it would just be simplicity, you know, and it would be like, well, if you're unhappy with that, why don't you go and do something that makes you happy? And, you know, it's just that simplicity of why do we stay in misery? Why do we stay in making things hard for ourselves when we can choose to find something that makes us happy? And when you step in gratitude, with a positive attitude, you're going to find happiness. It, uh, you know, it, it's funny. And, and, you know, I do, I try to live a life of gratitude. And, you know, when I tell people, man, I, I feel like I'm the luckiest guy in the world. You know, I am, I am truly blessed. You know, some people look at me and say, you, you can't walk normally anymore. You can't do some of those things that you used to be able to do, but uh, you know, you're alive. I don't, I don't look at, a disability in terms of a disability. It's really new abilities that I have. I yes. um, had a really neat opportunity to talk with retired uh, uh, Nebraska Senator Bob Carey, who was a Vietnam veteran. Uh, he was a Navy SEAL uh, and he was injured in battle, lost one of his legs. And, you know, we were talking about some training business when I was still on active duty. And, you know, the, the conversation, you know, went to my injury and he had, he had heard about it. And, you know, he told me that, uh, um, you know, he had found he was able to do more things after his leg was amputated than he was actually able to do or willing to do before. And so, you know, I, I think just that approach on life is, you know, embrace what you can do, embrace the new uh, and live a life of gratitude and, 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 you know, enjoy the blessings that have all been bestowed upon us. 
as one of the people I interviewed, I love the her terminology. It's not disabled; it's differently abled. Absolutely, I much I prefer that. that. But you know, we look at people who have lost limbs for whatever circumstances. They're dancing on the stars. You've got a young girl at the present moment that's on um, oh, the Survivor uh, show. Uh, and yes, it, it runs into complications. She had one where she had to get through a net and unfortunately a hook of her foot got caught and she couldn't get through it. But she has gone quite far and it's like, oh, take the leg off altogether and hop her way there. It's like, it's just a challenge. It's just an obstacle. It means I've got to do it a different way, but it's not going to stop me from having an experience. And we see this over and over again, people with you know, artificial limbs uh, going, okay, I've just got to learn how to do this in a different way. So, so what I'm hearing right now, and I'm, I'm motivated by everything that you've said uh, this afternoon, um, and I'm going to go home and tell my wife that Sarah Troy convinced me that I can skydive, sweetheart. <laughs> I know I didn't. <laughs> no, I, I, Why don't you bungee jump while you're at it? <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's the, the grit, the resilience, yeah. the toughness to be able to say, you know, people would assume that I can't do this. And, you know, that, that was, again, my, my motivation to get back to full duty in the Navy. Um, I, I can't find, nor can other people find any record of, you know, other, you know, Navy admirals who have been confined to a wheelchair. But, you know, I was able to do that. I, the Navy accepted that. Uh, they exactly. said, we want you to try this. Uh, and, you know, that was- And a, you're an example of what is possible for others. Agree, agree. And in, in, in a society where, you know, 40 years ago, and again, the mm -hmm. example of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, that where they, they hid uh, mm -hmm. his wheelchair, um, you know, I'm, I'll get out and I'll be loud and proud, however I need to get around. And, you know, no longer is that uh, a stigma for me. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the thing about life, and, and I'm just telling a story about the skydiving, actually, is that it was my ex-husband's 50th birthday, and I took him blindfolded out to this area and then I took the blindfold off and I said you're about to jump from a plane at 10,000 feet and all he said is the insurance up to date <laughs> <laughs> and he said if it bungee jumping went and did it and he went and did it and he found it so exhilarating so utterly exhilarating and I thought well that was the greatest gift I could give him a sense of I am 50 I'm exhilarated what's the next chapter of my life right and I think you know no, I'm not saying do <laughs> I'm not going to be responsible for that. You can get your frills in another way. But, <laughs> but the thing is, is um, we get so crippled by our fears of what could go wrong rather than we're not willing to try things. Again, common sense and sensibility must be your guiding compass. But don't let fear or the other big one is what will people think? I don't give a hoot what people think anymore. I spent 50 years worrying about what people thought. What a waste of life. You know, I am what I am. You can take me or leave me, right? If I want to try something, I will try it. It's my business, not yours. But I'm not saying jump from a plane, please. <laughs> All right, I, I stand corrected. <laughs> Go and try something else. Deep sea diving. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I've, I've still got lots of things that I, that I want to accomplish. And, uh, um, you know, we, we uh, you know, wake up every morning and, you know, we, we go on vacations. Um, you know, we, we live life no differently than we did before my accident. Right. Uh, just you just have to compromise a little bit. That's problem solve. Yes. Differently able to and compromise and problem solve. And, uh, you know, this thing, um, your body is your vessel for your heart, soul and spirit. Right. And. You know, when, when you open up to that, that God source energy that comes through your soul and speaks through a beautiful heart, you're living in your truth. That ignites your spirit interaction and your mind will know what it needs to know when it needs to know it. When we trust in that divine guidance, that compass, that love, it will always show us the way. We've just got to get out of our heads and listen. And, and I, will, I will go back to what I started with. Um, you know, for, for everyone, it's important to remember, you know, regardless of what you're facing, God has a plan for us. Mm -hmm. We're all here for a reason. Mm -hmm. And despite your circumstance or condition, we can always make a difference in the lives of others. And that's how I'm trying to live my life right now. And don't, don't um, assume, don't judge, don't demand, just allow. 
how it's going to make a difference in somebody else's life. Because each person is going to hear, feel, and react in the way they need to mm -hmm. with what's going on in their own lives right now. So whether it's one word, one statement, or the whole thing, whatever it is, if it's pivoted somebody towards positivity, to believing they can, believing they're worth it, that there is nothing that can stop them, fantastic, right? But it's to each person, we have no control how people receive or what they do with it. All we do is we put it out with a pure heart and pure intent. And again, what people do with it, it's in that vibration. May they pick it up and use it wisely. Live your life with relentless positivity. Exactly. Yes. And that relentless positivity, along with the heart, God, soul, spirit, will never see you wrong. You know, relentless positivity means that you are always in belief. You're always in a positive belief that anything good can happen. Even when the bad happens, good can come out of it, right? We always good can come out of a situation. You know, during COVID, how many people's lives pivoted to a totally new direction? Mm -hmm. How many people stopped and paused for a moment and looked at what was important in their life, their family, or they weren't doing what they really love to do. And they suddenly had a moment to think about it. How many good things? Yes, a lot of bad things came out of it, but a lot of good things came out of it as well. And if we can look at the good things and try and look at how to prevent the bad things in the future, hallelujah. But always focus on the good because the good will always show us the solutions. Amen. And, you know, as, as we're talking here, um, one of those good things for Kyle Kozad, uh, if if I was never hurt and I never wrote this book, uh, I wouldn't have had an opportunity to meet Sarah Troy. So um, I very much appreciate that. Bless you. Bless you. Very kind of you. Uh, I'm right back at you. You know, it is. Um, nobody gets through life unscathed. Nobody but it's how we handle it. It's how we handle it, what we do with it. Where are we willing to discover our courage? Are we just willing to discover our strength? Are we willing to discover those abilities we never knew we had? Mm -hmm. Are we willing to be that inspiration for other people? Are we willing to always believe that there is more out there and to be exploratory, to be, you know, wonderment in our own self-discovery of what's next and how can it benefit everyone else as well as me i love that i love that yeah it's uh it's important again it goes beyond the words we say uh but it's more about the actions that we demonstrate the words are just an invitation to act on it mm -hmm. as i say actionism <laughs> i love it <laughs> thank you so much for sharing here today and just just you know the entire journey that you've taken you know you've shown what tenacity and what resilience and what determination can do. And it doesn't matter what a person's circumstances, it doesn't matter what they're facing. When you are determined to make good, something good happen out of it, whatever it is, when you're determined to work on it, when you're determined to allow others to help you, when you're determined to bring faith, whatever your faith is, into mm -hmm. the equation and partner with you, it will always lead you to where you need to be doing what you are meant to do and inspiring those you are meant to inspire. Well, thank you very much. And, and again, you know, my, my hope is that, uh, you know, through conversations like ours today, you know, even if there's one listener that takes, you know, a sliver of inspiration uh, or a sliver of purpose out of what we've talked about, uh, then uh, this was time exceptionally well spent. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, the, how people can get the book is twofold. They can get it from Amazon, but they can also go to navalaviation.com book, Relentless Positivity, and they can get it there as well. And uh, this also benefits uh, some other people. That's right. So, you know, just as we talked about the stories of, of courage of your father, uh, you mm -hmm. know, I attribute a lot of my toughness, resilience, ability to, you know, be adaptive uh, to my time in naval aviation. And so 100% of the proceeds uh, will go back to the Naval Aviation Museum Foundation. So we can tell stories, we can continue to tell stories about heroes from the past for generations to come and come. Exactly. And, you know, those heroes, um, they're heroes for a reason, and they certainly open up the doors. Now, people can also find you at LinkedIn as Kyle 
Kozad, C-O-Z-A-D, Kyle, K-Y-L-E. And uh, the what um, you had another site too, love. Um, uh, on uh, Instagram, it's Rear Admiral KC. Okay. And so people can reach out to you anywhere uh, there. But, you know, uh, Christmas is coming, folks. And, you know, I think the greatest gift you can give is a book because a book keeps on giving. And if you know somebody at the present moment that's in a transition of life, you know, anybody, we're all in transition of life, we're always in transition, we're going in a journey. Um, but, you know, you know that it will have an impact on somebody that's just needing to know how or needing that little kick at the butt of positivity that's going to put them in the right path. A book of inspiration is one of the greatest gifts you can give because not only does it keep on giving to that person, but if they ever pass the book on, it keeps on giving. And look mm -hmm. at who it supports. It supports, you know, the, the Naval Museum Foundation to make sure that these other stories keep going out there. We learn from other people's stories. We're inspired by other people's stories. Other people's stories reflect back on us and show us how much more we can be if we allow ourselves to be. So keep the story going. Thank you so much, Kyle, for sharing here today. Sarah, thanks for having me today. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure too. Until next time, folks, find your positivity. It's in you. Bye for now. We hope that you enjoyed the show. Find all of our shows on selfdiscoverymedia.com under podcasts or selfdiscoverymedia slash shows. And for all our current shows, go to What's New. We are supported by you, the audience. You'll see a nice big shiny blue button for one-time donations or follow us on Patreon and you will be able to support us there. We enjoy bringing you such wisdom. And the next show will be up in just a moment.